recommend a vector transfer to the BFS. Discovery 4 computers now have primary control of critical vehicle functions. Glispugin, sitting in front of the computer, is trying to type. He places both hands above the keyboard. He gives up, exhausted, and his hands drop into his lap. After resting for a time, he raises his hands again, only to drop them as before. My definition of electronic literature is, I want to say stories, because I always associate stories with literature. And electronic means that there has been either some intervention in the authoring process, which involves digital technology, or in the delivery process, which has I try to recall winter as if it were yesterday, she says, but I do not signify one way or another. By five, the sun sets and the afternoon melt freezes again across the blacktop into crystal octopi and palms of ice, rivers and continents beset by fear, and we walk out to the car, the snow moaning beneath our boots and the oaks exploding in series along the fence line on the horizon, the shrapnel settling like relics, the echoing thundering off far ice, this was the essence of wood, these fragments say, and this darkness is air. Poetry, she says, without emotion, one way or another. I wrote this in Michigan. I actually can remember the sound of on freezing days. They may, may not have been oaks exploding, but the trees kind of popping off along the ridge. And I remember also having walked to my office and seen the afternoon melt freezing across the blacktop like crystal octopi. I'm having an incredible deja vu looking at the screen. My definition of electronic literature would be any form of writing that is dynamic, meaning it can be collaborated on or edited or changed at will. A check tablecloth laid in an isolated clearing, a bottle of red wine, two glasses of cheese and bread. Walking the sound of water, water. weight capped the sound of water, or a bottle of Cabernet mountains. Sauvignon set on a wooden tablecloth, cold cold water. Water. set on a wooden tablecloth, cold Four. water, crystal goblets, Four. unexpectedly crystal goblets. Midnight. unexpectedly at midnight, purple lupine on the hillside, beside the Dempsey dumpster in town, walking down to the water, where the homeless gather, a flower, a flower dress. dress. Unexpected woodland events. Wait, capped mountain water in winter. A bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon set on a linen tablecloth. Cold, cold water. water. A flower dress. The smell of hops and honey. The smell of green in grass. The outflow of a stone by the river. The a smell of front green door. grass. Under the eaves of the, by the river. The, the cabin where we were working. The sound of water. White capped mountains. Purple lupine on the hillside, making love. Electronic literature is forms of literature that make use of the uh, computer or the network context uh, to achieve uh, effects that wouldn't be possible in print. My birth takes place more than once in the plea of a bygone monster from a muddy hole by corpse light under the needle and under the pen. Or it took place not at all. But if I hope to tell a good story, I must leapfrog out of the muddle of my several births to the day I parted for the last time with the author of my being and set out to write my own destiny. So it might start with smell, when that's possible in the future. At present, it starts with image very dominantly and proceeds through text to sound in kind of a, a hierarchy, which I very much dislike. But I think the opportunities within that for interaction between those different senses and different means of generating stuff are just fantastic, particularly when we bring similar algorithms to bear on all of them. And we see their interactions both at the code, the sonic, 
the visual and the meaning level. Electronic literature is the exploration of concepts beyond the ordinary using electronic means and in traditional vision-based media you have moving pictures, you have more traditional genres such as you know printed text where things don't move around but electronic literature involves exploring how we take concepts how we perceive the world and ourselves and trying to portray that using computation using the specific processes that are unique to computers there are two main literary parents for me for the fiction and one of them is Thomas Pynchon mm -hmm. and um, Gravity's Rainbow which is a novel which contains within it music hall numbers, popular songs, equation. Uh, there are there are no there are no visible artworks, but there is a tremendous reference to the language of, of art and film and music and theater. And that was a that was a mental model for me that the novel did not have to proceed in a linear fashion using only narrative. Electronic literature for me is literature that takes advantage of the capacity of new media to um, alter the state of writing. It's, it's literature that engages its digitality. I remember sitting in my office when, when Jeff finished doing community college and thinking, oh, my God, this is too bad to read this thing. Prepared, sugar is not a quest volume. In the for glass the store, these preceded methods very Reach clean as there is no seen variety, very, very clean small there bridge, is no pleasure. overly moist prepared, climate. sugar is not a volume, not having examined the room, grabbing at these rags, kindness, related to the vulture, and shape, however, in varying sides and the door, for the sake, for the sake, journey, use, last, they are double, for the sake, and rapid exploration requires most commonly classes, while the body, by the crowd, justified by appeal, Electronic literature is two words that go together, resonate together. Uh, I, I suppose I would say it is can be considered a practice involving text that resonates with considerations of media, resonates with uh, problems of media or platforms of media, taking advantage of platforms of media, as Amrit said, or for me, resonating with conceptual issues involving mediation and digitization of information. So the first screen you see is this big image made in Mac Paint, if anyone knows what that is. It's just a, like a splash page, an image of the patchwork girl herself. Click through it to what is essentially a title page, Patchwork Girl or a Modern Monster by Mary slash Shelley and herself. And from here, you have links to five different sections of the text. The graveyard, the journal, the quilt, the story, and something called broken accents. I think electronic literature is literature which requires a device to be read. And the device has to be electronic. And I work with artist books. Um, I was influenced by the works that I saw in camera works, um, by um, works in San Jose, which is um, and by the art space of San Jose State that Stephen Muir, Moore curated. So I was in a field that was halfway between visual arts and halfway between writing. Mm -hmm. And of course performance art also that I was associated with, and the artist books. So those were uh, interests that I continued with. Electronic literature is machine-enabled stories, poems, images uh, that are not available only as traditional prints or uh, sculptural uh, events. They're mediated by machines and they don't exist in, in a, a format that the other arts have traditionally taken. Boxes, raising the dirt, only several colors, tall the one cluster away, variety each a method, package of seeds, distance, the several not stone, in rows. especially smooth, location chip it down, magnify the bottom, darting in the habitual shadow, seeing bending. We're all moving toward storytelling in digital space. 
and some of the most interesting experiments that are happening are in um, electronic literature. You're coming out of a, a Dadaist tradition uh, of saying there is there's something beyond this and and I'm, I'm going to rearrange this stuff and, and find other layers beyond the visible or make other layers. I think electronic literature is digital born literature that would not exist otherwise than by mediation through a computer. Electronic literature is the exploration of how we can tell stories with the augmentation uh, of technology. So what technology makes possible in our storytelling palette. And particularly thinking about kind of the networked and connective tissues of literature and storytelling and the ways that we realize those through the technologies we already use all the time, particularly on the web. The lack of clear signal rules is an attempt to vex you, uh, rather an invitation to read either inquisitively or playfully and playfully and also object if and where it gets interested or invite you. Electronic literature can be a number of things. It, it's interactive. It has to do with words and images. I go in and out of what to call myself. I still say different things. But within the community, I create electronic literature, yeah. which, which I would call poetic narrative. So I'm a poet who works with narrative. I, I think the day that comes that we don't actually distinguish it as electronic literature is the day that, that uh, we finally, uh, well, I, would be the day that, well, we don't have to ask questions like that again. Ah, uh, an otherworldly glass of beer. A pier ah, with black but wouldn't you like an otherworldly ah, glass of beer? But wouldn't you like an otherworldly a glass of black beer? bushes, just beside the trail as you crest the hill. Amber-colored beer in a tall crystal glass, white, white almond, almond and sides. The smell of hops and honey, a golden ice box. Ah, but wouldn't you like an otherworldly glass of beer? The sound of water, white capped mountains, amber colored, the sound beer of a tall water. crystal white glass, white capped mountains, cold water, amber colored, beer white in a tall running down glass. the sides, cold water, Looking down to the water, the smell of hops and honey, the daily in and out flow of a billion bites, the daily the smell in and out green flow grass. of a billion bites, the the stone the smell of river of green grass. Go red. It is word, image, sound, moving image, touch, bits, mind, body, heart. To be linked to the chain of existence and events, yes, but bound by it, no. I forge my own links. I'm building my own monstrous chain. And as time goes on, perhaps it will begin to resemble, rather, a web. Primarily artistic work that has a strong emphasis in the literary, but cannot be divorced from its medium, which is digital, and so uh, you can't print it. It's not like an ebook. One of the challenges I had set for me for this text was to try to write a novel that no 20th century writer could write, and the only way to do that is obviously to try to push the text itself beyond what it's possible. To, possible to do. So including projective at things like the oracle, including a borrower that literally takes the text and reconfigures it in ways that cannot be predicted. And that, I think, is you know what Burroughs is getting at. It's that um, the, the, the text itself can be exploded and that when you take those pieces and reassemble them, something new can come out that you did not even put there, that you did not know was there. Um, and that is what makes it, a, a, that pushes it beyond what you can, you as a writer can possibly do. I guess I would say that electronic literature is reading, um, and it could be it could be symbols, it could be icons, um, through some sort of electronic means. It could be digital, it could be analog electricity, and so something I would say interactive would be maybe 
a key word, but not necessarily. Um, kinetic, perhaps, are a couple of things, but I feel like it's such a broad thing. It's hard to just define. I think you, you just got to be, be open to what's out there. Hypertext, to put it clearly, is a mapping of a text onto a four-dimensional space. Normal grammars, then, do not apply and become branching structures anew, fragments, branches, links. The word is glowing and on a screen. It is electronic and cannot be touched. It has been copied over thousands of times and reverberates through virtual space. The text coils in on itself. It is a topographic map of the air currents in the upper atmosphere, those sudden winds that change direction inexplicably. The reader becomes a sort of satellite taking photographs of a huge and varied terrain. The reader can see the whole world or zoom in to see a particular ant on the banks of the sun. The ant has six legs. The reader is staring at a video screen. How then to turn the page? To me, electronic literature is any kind of uh, literary practice that does not depend on the printed page, but may include the print. Remember, I have to remember, you have to remember, that um, I wrote this entire text in the machine, and so I was always its first reader, and I was discovering the ways it had changed in there. There was never a flow chart, there was never any, any, any set of text to say, say the way through, so I was pursuing kinds of texture too. There are a lot of electronic literature classes, but how many are actually teaching students the range of what they can do in the field? How many new student writers are we producing? We are producing some, but not enough. It was one of my central theses in Patchwork Girl that there is no central thesis, <laughs> that there is no center, that there is no self, there is only a temporary and contingent coming, contingent coming together of influences and borrowed pieces that could as easily have come together in another form mm -hmm. and will come together in another form that the desire to make oneself coherent and permanent is a doomed one, but not only doomed, also an unhealthy one, that part of our job is to learn to let go <laughs> of ourselves. And literature is one of the ways we learn to let go of ourselves, let learn to release ourselves into the stream of other people's thoughts and visions and to enjoy that alienation from our own monotonous dream of consciousness. And I think literature is this, the use of language to sort of disrupt the, its in, instrumental applications, right? So um, the question of electronic literature then is, how, do, how are people working in the uh, digital vernacular or the emerging sort of media landscape to um, <laughs> estrange people from the, the conventional codes that, that try to organize human behavior and to create an occasion for something uh, otherwise? We look now at how simple it is to create immersive, full-res images. And we just did not have that technology. So I am, I am very happy with the narrative premise, and I'm very happy with the way I executed, given the constraints. But I, I would really wish I could fix some of those pictures. Electronic literature is anything that you can't do in a linear print, and electronic is the wrong word here. It's anything that stretches text beyond what we have been doing. So I'm actually not too happy about the electronic digital analog idea. What I want to say is that we are stretching text and I'd like to go back to the traditional meaning of hypertext which was overactive text. Complex, more material, drinking, genetic, memory content, dancing ground, the masses against control, complex, more material, the spiral, a life faster, me split, unite. For me, electronic literature is anything that's generated 
in new media that involves reading and writing. And that reading and writing can be connected to any um, other medium because of the electronic context. Closure is, a, as in any fiction, a suspect quality, although here it's made manifest. I wasn't aware exactly how inflammatory that was. I've been burned by that over the years, and people say, oh, if I'm, I remember somebody writing in, in the New York Times saying that this was an immoral work because it didn't have a beginning, middle, and end, and that literary work should have a beginning, middle, and end, and that closure was what made something moral. When the story no longer progresses, or when it cycles, or when you're tired of the paths, the experience of reading it ends. Even so, there are likely to be more opportunities than you think there are at first. A word which doesn't yield the first time you read a section may take you elsewhere if you choose it, and you encounter the section again. And sometimes what seems a loop, like memory, heads off in another direction. There is no single way to say this. Probably the most well-known sentence in the entire work is that you read the first sentence, is there is no single way to say this. My response to what is electronic literature is, if you can read it, see it, hear it, play it, and sing it, it's probably electronic literature. Midnight and at who? Devotes Midnight only and him. at who? Devotes and only the system out of the lobby of a long departed guest, whose password still resided in my memory. Midnight the and at who? Devotes only him. at that hour. She too entered the system who? out of the lobby. Who are you, guess two? Guess? Scroll Who's across my screen to read by a chat request? request? Electronic literature is literature that's made on the computer and intended to be read on the computer. Digital work uh, that addresses questions of uh, reading and writing. And I believe that electronic literature is literature that uses the internet or computers or mobile phones or such technology to function. My definition of electronic literature would be a multimodal digital production meant to be read on a screen, computer screen. As far as electronic literature goes, whoa, that's a toughie. I, I think it, it's literature that can't be presented in a static way, such as on a printed page. So there's something about the digital that is intrinsic to the, the work of art. My definition of electronic literature um, is digital narrative is the first term that comes to mind because that's how I entered into the group. But the longer I have been here, I have found it means poetics, it means coding, it means all sorts of ways of manipulating language using digital technology, and not always to tell a story. <laughs> well, for me, um, electronic literature is a strange hybrid that combines uh, a literary sensitivity with uh, all the potential that digital technology can provide to the artist. Literature, whether consumed or created on some type of electronic medium, which would mean something or anything that needs electricity or requires electricity. It's organic, like the branches of a tree. Yeah, it's an electric toaster in that tree that serves up pop-up poetry. I would define electronic literature as any text that can only exist on a computer. Electronic literature feels to me like something that has been deliberately left undefined and perhaps undefinable. I think that it's a concept in transition uh, that may actually never find a definition and fade from our vocabulary before anything gets codified, settles in. They think electronic literature is anything that is branching and interactive. Works that make use of uh, the capabilities of the digital context uh, and the digital properties to create pieces of work. I don't know, some kind of, that kind of stuff. <laughs> I consider electronic literature to be 
literary work, work with interesting literary aspects that takes advantage of the capabilities of the computer, whether it's networking, multimedia, computation, interactivity, uh, and it, uh, it is extending what the literary means using computation and computers and their capabilities. When I think about what is electronic literature, it gets kind of tied up with other terms that we have used to define this field. We call it hypertext, digital literature, new media literature, electronic literature, all those four terms have been used to define the field or, or name the field that we are in. Hypertext was one of the earliest names and it extends beyond um, the, the electronic screen. It, uh, if you go back to Ted Nelson's definition of that, it's a conceptual way of how do you provide more text to than what is, what is traditionally available or possible in a printed book. Um, then when we got to computers, the, it was a natural medium for creating those hypertext type of experiments. Um, that then morphed into digital literature and to, uh, into elect, um, digital literature and new media literature. Um, I hate the term new media literature because it arrogantly assumes that what we are working in will always be the newest thing. Um, just like new criticism, after a time that term becomes dated. Um, but digital literature and now electronic literature. Um, the um, electronic literature is probably the broadest term for what we're working with, but it, we're still usually talking about something that's created for the computer. And um, But I think it should be still tied to some of those early discussions that we were having with hypertext. Some early themes such as multilinearity, uh, questions of authority, questions of agency, questions of interactivity, questions of play, that those would still be part of the questions of what we're talking about when we're talking about electronic literature. So it isn't just does it use electricity. It has to be to some degree in what way does it tie in with are composing a culture with one work upon another. The Pathfinders Project is a preservation project that aims to make electronic literature available for generations beyond us. This project is very important because if you think about it, early digital literature represents a cultural moment and a historical change in the way we think about literature. In Pathfinders, we used a concept called traversal, a way of capturing author and user interactions on the work's original platform. I wanted the reader to feel that there were distinctly different human stories. This is fundamentally embodied. Somebody told me it was their bedtime story every day, and uh, it was a lot of fun to do, and I also found telling the story that way appealed to the social media nature of, of the audience. We think this method of preservation in conjunction with things like migration and emulation will keep crucial works alive so that future readers can better understand them. Without a doubt, we have the potential to transform the field of digital media preservation. This multimedia book is just the beginning. Joining us for the fourth of seven live stream traversal broadcasts from the Electronic Literature Lab at Washington State University, Vancouver. Today we're performing the adventure game Amnesia, created by Thomas M. Dish. I'm Dini Grigar, the director of the lab and professor in the Creative Media and Digital Culture program here at Washington State. This event is part of the Born Digital Media Preservation Series celebrating the electronic literature's organization's move from MIT to WSUV. It's sponsored by WSUV as well as WSU's Lewis E. and Stella G. Distinguished Professorship, as well as the Electronic Literature Organization. If this is the first time you've joined us, you're probably wondering what is meant by traversal. So let me explain very briefly. This is a process that was developed by Stuart Malthorpe and me for the Pathfinders Project. It's defined as, quote, 
an audio and video recording of a demonstration performed on historically appropriate platform by an author and or reader of the work, unquote. So think of it more as a academic formal game playthrough. That's essentially what it is. In terms of amnesia, you can play an emulation of it today. But it, the work itself was published in 1986 on a five and a quarter inch floppy disk for the Apple II computer or a PC running uh, MS-DOS. A year later, it came out for Commodore 64. So in our traversal of the work, you will see Amnesia played on the Apple IIe, one of the two that we have um, in the lab, and experience firsthand what the work was like in its original iteration. That's hardware and software quirks and all. And one of the quirks, if you look at the recording here, um, is a series of blue tape going across the screen of this um, monitor. We had to do that because there's a lot of glare coming off this particular screen, and so we had to swipe a screen protector from a Apple Classic and tape it on to this Zenith monitor attached to my Apple IIe. So that's one of the many quirks you'll be noticing today. We're live streaming this traversal as well and capturing the social media that may be generated during the event. We've been collecting all of this information along with critical uh, commentary, images, and all kinds of stuff and putting this into a open source book on the Scalar platform that we've titled Rebooting Electronic Literature. And if you're on Facebook and Twitter, the URLs are probably showing up in your, in your feed right now. We're happy to announce today that Chapter 1 that features Sarah Smith, King of Space, is now available. So not only is the book open source, but the methodology is open because as we produce the book, we're making each chapter available to you one at a time. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues in the lab that work with me. Nicholas Schiller is Associate Director of L. Greg Philbrook is Instructional and Technology Support Specialist. Vanessa Rhodes is ELIT Research Assistant. Veronica Whitney is ELOG, ELIT Catalog Content Specialist. Mariah Gwynn is our Games Research Assistant. And finally, Katie Bowen is our Document Specialist. We'd like to acknowledge also author Sarah Smith, who recommended that we include Amnesia in our year-long celebration and live stream traversals. And she also gave us a very incredible pristine copy of Amnesia to use today. We also want to thank Trevor Dodge, who teaches in the game program here at, D at WSUV from 2007 to 2010. He co-hosted the Games and Digital Cultures podcast entitled First Wall Rebate with Sean Hinton and Sh uh, Shane Ryder. And in 2014, his experimental fiction work, A Beginner's Guide to Leet, is a flash story primarily executed in Leet speak. It was nominated for a Pushcart Prize. He's currently working on a memoir exploring the crucial role of video games, that, uh, the way they play in his survival and recovery from a sexually abusive and traumatic childhood. The link to this live stream will be archived at the ELL, e, at the e, e, L, <laughs> Electronic Literature Lab web, website, which we post on Facebook and Twitter. And our Facebook and channel, uh, channel and our ha uh, Twitter hashtags are both Edith Pathfinders. Trevor is going to be per, uh, performing for about 30 minutes, and then we're going to follow this performance up with a Q&A, and you can post your questions on any of these social media channels, and we will answer them in that session. So let's get started. May I turn this over to my friend and colleague, Trevor Dodge. Okay, so um, Dean already pointed out the first quirk. The second quirk is that I'm leading the traversal. So you have the quirk of the, the blue tape over the screen to cut down on the glare, but I'm, I'm more of the quirk of anything else. Uh, I do want to um, boot the game for you just to kind of get that experience, but uh, the packaging for this is really, really incredible. And uh, getting this copy, again, um, thank you so much for, for uh, letting us um, borrow it, uh, Sarah and to use it. Um, it's, it's quite a remarkable um, set of print objects that get us to this digital experience. And you know everything from the uh, street maps for this digital city uh, of Manhattan and visual representations of that stuff built into this commercial enterprise. The manual has um, also um, the kind of mark of something from the world, right? The, this this fictive thing that you are actually um, finding in the world, and alongside that are some really really helpful list of verbs. So when you get stuck for what to do, 
these can be really helpful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and boot this, and we'll see where it goes. So two five and a quarter, five and a quarter floppy disks, double sided, and um, the part of the experience of playing this game is literally pulling the disks out and to uh, reinsert them when prompted. While this is booting, um, since we saw that that lovely uh, EA logo from back in the day, you can see it back here also on this. Underneath all of the um, the credits for the programmers and for Dish is a company statement from Electronic Arts, and this is 1985-1986. I thought I'd just read this really quick, um, and just. It's, it's very, very interesting historically, I think. We're an association, they say, of electronic artists who share a common goal. We want to fulfill the potential of personal computing. That's a tall order. This is what they're saying about, <laughs> about their own deal. But with enough imagination and enthusiasm, we think there's a good chance for success. Ever the optimist. Our products, like this program, are evidence of our intent. Again, our products, like this program, are evidence of our intent. So of course it begs the question, what's, what's the intent with something like this, and with this thing in particular? Um, the, the packaging actually has a very lovely photograph of Mr. Dish right here, and uh, there's something very urban about the packaging, but I also think that there's something really kind of masculinist about, about the packaging. And if you read into the biography and study up on, on Mr. Dish, not only a very, very accomplished science fiction writer, but also um, somebody living um, as a gay man, a very, um, for the most part, kind of a subdued existence and, and performance of that identity. And I think that uh, there's some interesting ways to, to interpret not just what is happening in the game in terms of uh, gender performance and gender identity, but also how there might be things from, from Dish's own life that are being reflected in this uh, fairly, you know, um, uh, verbose and well-written and um, really like very stylistic uh, tech experience. So I should stop talking and let's get started. You wake up feeling wonderful. <laughs> That's good. And also in some indefinable way strange. That usually goes with being wonderful is also strange. <laughs> Slowly as you lie there on the cool bedspread, it dawns on you that you will have absolutely no idea where you are, a hotel room by the look of it, but with the curtains drawn, you don't know in what city or even what country. Then the blank of where am I uh, balloons into the bigger the total blank of who am I? It's a question without an answer. So who am I as an entry point into the narrative? But I also think that there's something to be said about this as an experiment, not only for us as players, but then ultimately probably uh, for Dish himself um, to connect what we uh, how we project um, something internal to something external and uh, are those things connected at all and games I think a lot of times give us a really really powerful way to explore that thing and so what you have on the screen in front of you right now is this very interesting um, I guess uh, credit screen right and what's what's the uh, space in 1986 between what a video game is or a computer game is and what a film might do, what a television program might do, and certainly what a novel might do. And Electronic Arts, with the publication of this, might be intending to fulfill the maximum potential of, of computer gaming by trying to find where those gaps are and maybe even filling them with things like amnesia. Because no matter what you think about the game, it's an incredibly ambitious project, especially considering the time that it was made. So more credits here. Um, and I'll move forward now into the actual gameplay. You wake up in a hotel room, what's a person to do in such a situation? What you do is, well, the thing that I always do in these games is I look. I look a bunch um, when I'm playing not just games like this one, but uh, you know, modern AAA uh, adventure games on consoles too. I spend a lot of time just standing and pivoting and trying to, to take inventory of what's around me and, and uh, I guess part of the that is from my own formative experiences playing games uh, like this one and trying to imagine what what I have in front of me and what I can do with it and so inventories and look are commands that I give the computer all the time um, I'm sure by no means am I unique in that 
Um, but that's a really important way for me to, to get, like I feel, anchored in, into the world. So I am carrying zero pounds, I have 100% energy. I'm worth a dollar, which is which is great because you you know you account for inflation. So a dollar, and it's Sunday, 9:10 a.m. In my hotel room, I'm a total zero, which <laughs> we won't go there. And so that's what's there to look at. I'm gonna get out of bed. And as I do, I realize from a glance at your naked body that you are white, male, and reasonably well put together. But what about your face? That's part of in, uh, that's part of anyone's identity that should be proof against amnesia. So it's a really peculiar way to begin, I guess, the character construct of who are you, and you're asking that question very deliberately in this game. It's put in front of you, you know, on on the, on the monitor. And here's the quick answer to that. You're naked, you're white, you're male, and you're, quote, reasonably well put together. And so what does that mean exactly? And now you're supposed to verify that for yourself. Um, so you look in the mirror, and closing your eyes, take an inventory of how you think you ought to look. So again, this internal kind of self projected out and then verified by something external, in this case a mirror, but, but also um, if we want to play with some of the uh, gender theory that might help an informed reading of this, at least just one possibility of it, is that's kind of what we're, what we're doing all the time, is, is seeking validation um, outside. And here is a moment where that's happening very, very early in the game to have that kind of validation. So your hair, is it light or it's dark? <laughs> um, I, think it's, I don't remember, honestly. I'm going to say dark. Is it long shot? It's, it's pretty short. Do you have a beard or a mustache or neither or both? Um, I kind of have both. What is the color of your eyes? Uh, I have hazel eyes. All right. That seems a little pejorative, doesn't it, Greg? All right. You could <laughs> hardly be more completely mistaken. Wow. Okay. So for when you look into the mirror, the stranger you see there has a long blonde hair. Oh, I wish. He only has a beard. <laughs> there is no mustache. That'd be all right. And his eyes are emphatically blue emphatically so one of the things that I've noticed a lot in, in my practice traversals with this is these really um, interesting uh, choices of words that the dish gives us especially his adverbs I think <laughs> they can be very very strong and uh, maybe we'll see some of those pop up in in the options that we pursue here so I don't really recognize myself, myself in the mirror um, in the hotel room, um, in the Sun Sunderland Hotel, and again, um, some of the documentation that comes with it is connected to this fictive place. So here is the guide to that fictive place. So the world of the game continues to unpack in front of me. I'm in room 1502. There's a Gideon Bible and a ballpoint pen. So I'm going to take... Oh, hang on. Oh, and also... In the room to the left of the dresser is an Apple computer. Of course. You do a slow double take. Have computers become standard equipment for hotel rooms in the same way that TVs are? And what a fascinating question to ask in like 1985, 86. Mm -hmm. Because in the year 2018, there is virtually no difference between a, a computer um, and, a, and a, t a computer monitor and a television set, especially in hotel rooms. It's really interesting. So I'm going to turn on the computer because that's what I do before I get up and even put my clothes on. I got to turn on the computer <laughs> without having to look for the switch to turn it on because I know how to do that. I think what's part of what's fascinating about this and part of why it probably exists in the game is to create something metafictional and it's aware that it's a computer program that it's operating on a specific platform, in this case obviously an Apple IIe and and the computer program is aware of that and is kind of um, giving me a another layer of experience that that is primary and, and also secondary here now. So I've got that. I'm going to try to type type on the keyboard. Speaking of this, the keyboard. It's so interesting to go back to these um, these legacy machines 
and not just appreciate those experiences that I can remember, but maybe for people who've never experienced them in their past, and you, you encounter one for the first time today, that the keys are a little bit more narrow, but they tend to have more travel, and uh, there's something that's really teleporting about that that I think is, is quite re remarkable sometimes. The, key, the word keyboard cannot be used here. He doesn't like that word. So uh, how about if I say type? That didn't quite make sense. Um, all right. I'm going to turn off the computer. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. I turn the machine off. And I'm going to take the key that I saw. I'm actually going to try to take anything that it will let me. As I take the key, there's a knock on the door. You almost say, come in, before you remember, you don't have any clothes on. And it's true. So before I do that, I'm going to take the sheet from the bed. Good. And I'm going to wear the sheet. Then I'm going to open the door. It's a maid at the door, wheeling a trolley of linens. She takes one look at you, said, oops, sorry, puts the trolley into reverse and makes a dignified exit. So I'm glad that we all have our dignity. This is good. And with the sheet, hotel room, commonplace, it's going to be all right. So um, I'm going to look again at my inventory. Carrying two pounds. I have a metal key and a sheet. And that adds up to two pounds. Pretty good worth a dollar. <laughs> the value hasn't gone down even though he's had this encounter with the maid. That's good also to know. So what else? I'm going to take the Bible. And I'm going to leave the room now. As I walk into the door, obviously I don't get a leave just yet. The phone comes to life. It rings. I answer the Good morning, says a woman's voice after you say hello. This is the registration desk. You are aware, are you not, that the checkout time is 12 o'clock? I did not know that, but uh, hopefully it'll be all right. I'm only calling to inform you of the following. If you haven't checked out by that hour, Mr. Cameron, we will have to bill you for another night. So there's a detail that I will write down right now. It's always a good idea to have one of these and some of this with you um, to help yourself navigate this, visualize it in other ways than what you have as text on screen. So Cameron, that's a name, wrote that down. 1502, I wrote that down too. Do you wish to continue your stay? Well, it's been all right so far. I didn't get too waylaid by the thing with the maid, so I'm gonna stay. I assume you will want to put this on your visa card. That's a big assumption. How about I say no? So I only pay for cash. No, but I have the slip already made up. If you wish to make some other arrangement, I'll have to ask you to come down to the registration desk and ask me to do that. You can't, of course, not without proper clothing. All right, well, I guess that's that. Cameron, you test out the sound of the name she's given you, but can you be sure you are the Cameron that rented this room? Question. If your own signature as Cameron jives with the one on the receipt the bellboy is bringing, you saw a ballpoint pen somewhere. Oh yes, on the dresser. So I practice signing this name that doesn't feel like it belongs to me. The promised bellboy soon appears, wrapping your covers more securely around your waist. You answer his rapping on the door. He presents you with the adjusted hotel bill. One moment. So I've got the slip. Examine the slip, and on that slip. The name is John Cameron the third, so and I signed it, gave it back to the bellboy, and he's incredibly subtle, apparently, makes a significant cough. It must be waiting for the tip. You always, always, always tip your bellboy. He accepts the tip with a murmur of thanks. So alright, so he post I mean he postures for the tip, right? And then he pretends like he didn't really, he didn't really give it to him. It's okay. There's, there's decorum that goes through with this. 
try to consider what John Cameron's next move should be. That's also, of course, what uh, I'm really doing right now. You have to look everywhere that, where there might be clothes. So I'm going to try to leave the room again. I probably should have taken the pen. I didn't even think about that until right now. You are now in a long corridor in the hallway. And there's an exit sign to one end of it, it looks like. Halfway down the corridor, there is a branching northward and an arrow directing you to a bank of elevators. So at the moment, the hallway is deserted. Save for the maid laundry trolley, some five do doors away, and yourself. So I'm going to go to the trolley and see if it lets me do anything with the trolley. It's parked outside room 1509. And inside, vacuum cleaner. Trolley has a singular, single large bed blanket, stock of supplies, bottles, brush, rag. So I'm going to see how much of this stuff it's going to let me take. I'm going to take the blanket. And I got it. Good. And can I take the supplies? You have no conceivable use for the object, so you leave it where it is. Okay. And then I have bottles, take bottles. You have no use for bottles, none. Okay, take brush. Also, no conceivable use. You could you could not think of anything that you would need a brush or bottles to do. What if I take the trowel and see if it lets me do some of that? You could not, you cannot possibly, like it's not, not possible. <laughs> Why? You can't, you can't, it makes sense. You can't put it anywhere on you. But if I, I try to push the trolley, can I do that? Try reworming it. Um, okay. So, how about I go to my list of verbs here real quick. They should pull the room. Should I try to uh, arise? Attack it, board it. I mean, there's all look all these possibilities. You see all that? Escape, examine, force, force trolley. Mm -hmm. Like maybe like Darth Vader force trolley. The word force. All right. Um, I'm gonna go in the room. Uh, go in room 1509. Oops, my number one key. There it is. And the maid is vacuuming the carpet in there. Excuse me, sir. No one is allowed in empty hotel rooms except for the staff. And I'm asked to leave. And so there's nothing to do in the room, I guess. Okay. So I'm going to leave the hallway. Um, how about let's go west? Sorry. How about if I keep going west? And more room doors. I think I'm at the edge of the room. Nope. There, now I'm at the edge of the room. Door with the lighted exit sign over it. I'm going to open the door. It says into a stairway. Open door. Okay. The door opens onto the landing of the wide stairwell. The concrete steps and walls are painted battleship gray. So I'm going to look around a little more. And the most important thing to know is that the walls are painted battleship gray. Okay. I am going to ascend. Last time we descended, right, Greg? Yeah. yeah. You mount the stairs slowly to the next landing. Great verb choice. Mount the stairs. The concrete feels cold under your bare feet. In a moment or two, you find yourself before a door marked Sunderland Health Club. Authorized personnel only. Okay. So I'm in the spa you find yourself on a gravel rooftop immediately in front of you 
a drained swimming pool surrounded by deck chairs. Beyond the pool is the penthouse proper, a flat roof, windowless brick structure with a metal door from which the weather has almost entirely peeled away the lettering. It's really interesting how Dish has done this because in, in most ways this is something that only kind of pros could do, is the, the quality of what's being described here. Um, there's a, a short story that I absolutely love uh, written by David Foster Wallace called Forever Overhead where he does something really, really similar with the description of a snack bar at a, at a public pool in Arizona, and he leaves off a couple of the letters. This really reminds me of that. It's fascinating. So um, I'm going to look around a little more and see if it loads that thing again. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what I have on me again. Oh, I have a blanket, and I have a sheet. That's right. So I think what I might do is uh, I'm going to wear the blanket instead. Okay, remove sheet. Just real quick. I want to look, look appropriate when I go in here. The sheet's not going to be as good. And very, very quickly, I'll put the blanket on. Okay. So, um, let's see. What's this thing? Rooftop penthouse proper windowless brick structure. I'm going to take that sheet again. Apparently I dropped it. Um, let's see. I'm going to use some compass directions here. I'm going to try going east. Can't go that way. Can I go west? Nope. Can I go north? Nope. Can I go south? Nope. I must need to open something. I cannot open that. Open door. The door opens. Uh, reception area with cast iron. Uh, furniture with cast iron and vinyl armchairs, water cooler, paper cups, faded posters of once famous bodybuilders. Interesting. A sign on the front desk promises that someone will be back in 10 minutes. Elevators open to the reception area. The one on the left is Mark Dolls. The one on the right, guys. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Open, guys. Let's see if that's a phrase. And here is the prompt to flip the disc. It's really satisfying to do this, by the way, to like literally take, put it back in, hear the click. Great. In the men's locker room, to your right are two changing areas formed by freestanding metal lockers. To your left are some sinks and a large mirror, doors on either side. The door on the right is marked sauna, the one on the left, massage. Mm, this is a tough choice. Sauna or massage? Mm. Mm. This is one of those would you rather moments, like when you're driving in the car like really long, you know, like hours and hours. Hmm. I, I, I'm going to go for the massage, I think. I grew up in a desert, so like, sauna doesn't appeal to me too much. Oh, open massage door. Specify the right door or the left door. So, um, open left door then. It's locked. Open right door. And sauna opens. Your heartbeat quickens. Narrow confines of the steamy pine paneled cell bend and warp and tilt. That's great. That's a great sentence, actually. Mm -hmm. Look at that real quick. Your heartbeat quickens and the narrow confines of the steamy pine paneled cell bend and warp and tilt. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Yeah. You are barely able to keep yourself from falling against the iron stove and its pile of heated rocks. You crumble onto the bench of wooden slats and then, da da da, but this then is like no other then. It does not follow the time that's gone before. Like a fluid under tremendous pressure, the memories suppressed by your amnesia overwhelm you. At some cue supplied by this hot, dark cubby hole, your past supplants your present life. You are experiencing all caps deja vu. So. If we had like, we were talking earlier about a, a, a YouTube thumbnail that we could use for this, if we, if we had one, 
that that's that's the that's the thing right there, right? So this is the YouTube thumbnail, <laughs> and then over the top, it should say, "You are experiencing deja vu" in all caps. This is <laughs> very clearly get like a hundred million likes. You are locked in the cell. It is bare and dark, and smells of lives gone sour. Or, uh, what incredible writing! I mean, really and truly. You, it, it, yeah, like people making games today, like have text objects in them. Go back and look at this game and see, like, really how, you know, elegantly Dish writes these objects in here. The only light is a feeble fluorescent glow that slants in through the louvered grill in the iron door. You know the door is iron because you have been beating on it. Your hands are sore and your right eye is swollen shut. You ache all over. Well, I tried to get a massage, but it, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't have it. Worse than the ache is the hunger, and worse than the hunger is the fear that you will never leave this cell alive. You begin to scream. You know it will do no good. You'll probably be beaten again, but you can't help yourself. You scream the same senseless words over and over, a litany of terror. Uh, help me. At last, your screams attract the attention of your jailer. The grill, the door pushed aside. His face appears, leering in the aperture. What's the matter, Juanito? Juanito. Twanging Texas voice. Now, Dini, you grew up in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. So, did you ever meet anybody named Juanito who couldn't remember and was always dressed in a blanket? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Not generally. Not, okay. Well, you, you have amnesia, maybe you forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he does, but he forgot. You ask for food. <laughs> His eyes shrink to pinpoints of sadistic pleasure. Why? Sure, Juanito, you'll get fed just as soon as you ask for it, so as I can hear you. There's just two little words you got to say, and I'll bring you a nice big bowl of five-alarm chili. Because it's, it's Texas, of course. <laughs> he waits for you to say the two words that will get you fed. Um, boy. I, I'm just going to repeat what I said. How about, no, wait. I'm going to say this. I'm sorry. Whatever I did, please don't impose the five-alarm chili on me either. Sorry, Juanito, your dealer says, and slams the grill shut. Damn. You think, this is not possible. It is not legal. It can't go on. Not even in the state of Texas can a prisoner be treated like this. <laughs> what do you think about that, Dini? Is that true? <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably true. You have not been charged with any crime. There has been no trial. One minute you were driving your car back to your hotel, and the next a motorcycle cop was signaling for you to pull off to the side of the road. The worst of it is that no one knows you're here in Santa Candelaria, and so no one will think to report you missing. Suddenly you understand the meaning of hell. There's no way out. Wow. Um, there's no way out. I can't look. Jeez. Uh, can I, can I go anywhere? I'm going to see if I can move. No, of course not. There's no way out. Um, uh, I'm going to. Is, is cry one of my verbs? No. Mm -hmm. mm. It's it's really, really... Struggle is one of my verbs. I'm going to do this. Struggle. No. Um, go to sleep. And then, sudden as waking from a nightmare, this mind explosion of memory is over. But was it really a memory? Couldn't it have been, instead, some kind of waking nightmare? I'm thinking about this now, just briefly, in the context of 1980s like American television. This would have been either right on the heels or around the same time as like the, the famous Bobby Ewing scene in, JR, or, uh, yeah. in Dallas, right, where they, they killed off one of the most popular characters. There was such a tremendous cry among the, the viewers of that show. They petitioned the network to put him back on after a year. And so in the one of either the, the series or the, the season beginning or season ending, there's this c the shower scene mm -hmm. with, with the character yeah. that had been killed. And there he is. And it's like, oh, everybody was just dreaming that he died. The just, just kidding. The <laughs> so it's, it's also that, that quintessential creative writing trick. You get yourself painted into a box and then everybody is uh, just the fancy of your imagination, I guess. So now I'm in the massage room. 
interesting. I've seen this sauna before. A man's face bending down close to your own. You do not recognize him. Uh, in another smaller room where you are laying on your back on a masseuse. This is what I was trying to get in the first place. This is good. This is what I was trying to do. He's opened his eyes, another voice says. Yes, but there's this funny dazed look in his eyes. The same thing happened when he went into the sauna last night. Oh, and I thought it was from drinking too much. I didn't get to drink anything before I went in the sauna. We had to <laughs> carry him down to his room. Hey, Miss Cameron, are you all right? The man above you bends over to sniff your breath. Doesn't seem to be. No, I figure it's just heat prostration. There's the, there's there's these word choices. Really, really um, prosy. Tell you what, buddy, you mop up around the pool and I'll give you Cameron here once over lightly. Whatever he was wearing last night must still be in his locker. After that, I would appreciate it if you would steer him back to his room. So there is a locker. I'm going to write that down because that is something I have not seen yet. You find it strangely soothing with the massage. It's as though he were smoothing tensions from your mind and your muscles at the same time. That's kind of what the massage is. He rolls you over onto your stomach, but instead of continuing the massage, he turns on the sun lamp and leaves you alone in the room. Listen to the unmistakable crunch of steel through steel, and a moment later the masseur returns with a pair of metal cutters in one hand and a green canvas satchel in the other. It's an interesting massage. I mean, curious technique, sir. <laughs> Sorry to have to cut through your padlock, Mr. Cameron, but I remember how frustrated you got last night trying to remember the combination. I would have cut the lock off then, but you passed out in the sauna first. You're feeling a little better now. Um, honestly, not really. Now, don't get agitated, Mr. Cameron. You're going to be just fine. Just steer clear of the sauna in the future. I tried to do that in the first place. Take salt tablets. You know, on my way up here this morning, I heard on the radio this thing from the Consortium of Salt trying to like convince me that salt's really good for all the cells of my body. This is what it told me. <laughs> so here's here's more affirmation of this. This is good. Now I'll leave this satchel here with you, and when you've got some clothes on, buddy, will you help? Will will what? Buddy, okay, buddy will help you down to your room. There we go. So buddy, another NPC. You smile weakly and nod okay, and the masseur leaves you alone with the green canvas satchel. Uh, I gotta look around again real quick. Other than yourself and the green satchel, there isn't much in the masseur's room. So I'm gonna look at the satchel then. It's a green canvas satchel bearing a Nike album, <laughs> of course. The swoosh has even got product placement in this thing. That's interesting. It doesn't seem to have seen much use. Um, open the satchel. You zip open the satchel and find a pair of Levi's, a t-shirt laundered from red to rosy pink, a plastic book bag, a pair of Adidas running... Wait a minute. You got Adidas running shoes in a Nike satchel. Somebody's crossing their brands up. That's... No wonder this guy's in trouble. Well broken in and hallelujah, a small maroon address book. Quickly you put on the clothes that were in the gym bag. From the fit of both the jeans and the sneakers, there can be little doubt that they are yours. They must be Adidas shell toes, that must be why. You look at yourself in the full length mirror of the massage room and you see once again, or no, they wouldn't be Yeezys yet because that's way, way ahead of time, a complete stranger. But at least he's a stranger with clothes on. That's some improvement. There's a knock on the door and the masseur asks, are you ready to go back to your room? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, let's see if they'll let me do something here real quick. Um, let's see if I've still got elements in the satchel. Yeah. Uh, no. Can I bide some time? Uh, apparently I have to go back to my room now, and I didn't take that stuff. The masseur seems relieved when you follow Buddy out. He has been given your satchel, the plastic book bag, and a pass key. 
to room 1502, you take the elevator down to 15, Buddy leads the way to your room. Once you're inside the door, he hands you the satchel with the book bag and their contents and says goodbye. Oh good, so I got it all. Hmm. And I close the door in room 1502, a sigh of relief. It almost feels like home. Hmm. And a disc flip. And that would be is that a good place? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Feels, Feels like, like it is. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'll come over here and do the Q&A. So how do we... You stay there. Yeah. Do we need... I think the lights need to stay off, I think. Is that me? No, it's not. I'm getting all this junk in okay. It's been awful. All right. Okay, so we're open for Q&A, and so we'll start with the audience and the lab. Does anyone here have questions? And um, we're also taking questions online through Twitter, Facebook, and through the live chat. Comments as well. Sarah Smith is with us on the live chat, so if oh, she cool. has some comments she wants to make, I'd love to hear them. I've been following her comments um, throughout your performance, so um, it's but great, good to have her here. Well, yeah, thanks again, Sarah, for for the copy, it's in such fantastic condition. And it's really great. Let's yeah. pick it up again. Let's look yeah, at it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really so many amazing. Pieces too. I feel and like you, it and gloves you, for you it. did a good job going through all this material, and I think the most ex interesting thing is this map, right? So here's this map of Manhattan, and it's pretty true to life in 1986 when the game was released. I mean, here's the entire thing, and then you have this cool little. The gizmo in here. protection thing is in there, yeah. Yeah, to determine where your location is, right? So you've got this little... This, of course, will, will stop everybody dead in their tracks. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is what what would have uh, passed for copy protection back in that day. <laughs> it helps determine where your location is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's notched, and then you what you find clues for it in the game and then you can answer a very specific question. A lot of the copy protection from this age was go to page and find the third like word in the fourth paragraph or something so they knew for sure that you were holding the materials that came with the game. Now we have the two th the two the double uh, logged in on Apple, right? Oh right. Yeah. The double it's all biometric yeah. Now. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think what's interesting about this is all these uh, little objects are tied to the Sunderland Hotel, mm -hmm. which is where you wake up with amnesia. So this says compliments of the Sunderland Motel, Motel. Mm -hmm. and on this side, yeah. it says this is a guide, a visitor's guide to New York City, compliments of Sunderland Hotel. Yeah. So all of these are just incredible, you know, physical artifacts that go with games, almost like a, almost almost like a board game, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, if I think about this from the aspect of, of, of you know Thomas Dish not just you know having a set piece and characters inside this you know digital Manhattan but also a lot of the artifacts that go along with that he had to write these things too or at least conceive of them and then then uh, kind of bounce them off of a, a team of people to get feedback on but everything down not only from you know details of the place but but little advertisements to, to kind of give that illusion that, that this is an artifact from the world and uh, this is fairly common in uh, major um, games in too. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's always been a part of it. Is how do you take the virtual thing and then have something you know physical, tangible with it? Yeah. Well, it's a game world. I mean, what mm -hmm. he's developed is an entire not just the game itself, but all the elements that go with it to produce this game world, the whole story arc. Mm -hmm. You know, even giving us images. And I think your in your comments about the gender. The gender, the genderization of this, mm. but, you know, it's very male-centered, and it's aimed towards male players, right? It's a tuxedo we find on the bed. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not a wedding, not a white wedding dress like Billy, Billy Idol would have. <laughs> had. That's true. Right. Yeah, the the gender stuff in this is really fascinating for a number of reasons, um, and and uh, the inscription <laughs> of the player as a, a particular you know body in a particular. Um, uh, gender perform mm -hmm. um, kind of mandate goes along with that. Uh, yeah. And we were talking earlier about you have to get out of a hotel and get it to New York City to get any points. So the first time I played this game, I mm -hmm. went to the sheep farm, was married with six children to a wife named Alice, mm -hmm. and I had vague memories of some hotel in 
in New York City, right? And I got a thousand points roughly for getting that far. Oh, yeah. But then I played it again and I got in jail and I had to take the suicide pill and I had 50 points. Hmm. So I don't, I, I don't, I, didn't, I couldn't figure out after even three times playing how to get out of the, out mm -hmm. into the streets. Mm -hmm. And there's so much about the streets. Mm -hmm. Well, if you take that, I'm just kind of riffing here, but if you think about that, that little detail of, you get married and it's worth a thousand points there is very clear incentive both in the <laughs> game world but also in the real world to to pair up and to do that across a very you know calculated uh, uh, pairing of, of male and female and dish himself being a gay man um, it's like some really interesting um, ways to, to talk about what is in, well, not just expected but also what's rewarded in the culture and so, uh, Dish yeah, himself. Dying in a prison is not. Well, real yeah, but if you think about <laughs> Dish's own life too, I mean, he had a he had a, a lifelong partner, yeah. and that uh, uh, relationship would have never been officially recognized. It certainly would have been rewarded um, in the ways that uh, we, we would say today are very important and, and part of, of, uh, of a growing understanding. And so, uh, it, it, at what level is, is Dish commenting on that, and how? Ooh, how overt can you be about that in 1980s America, where this is a commercial enterprise trying to bring a lot of people into the fold, but it's very clearly, obviously aimed at a very specific gender demographic and, and a white audience at that, mm -hmm. too. Well, it's not surprising that the marriage was a shotgun wedding, right? Oh, he yeah, was forced yeah. to get married, so it wasn't his own choice. The father-in-law the father shows up with the gun and says, you will marry, and he makes sure that you go up to the penthouse suite to do the, uh, the chapel to get married, right? Mm. So there is some real mm -hmm. um, um, caustic commentary about the marriage. And the woman's name is Alice, and it, it, there's this kind of feeling that, well, you, so now you have these two kids, and then you have four kids because it's tri quintuplets. It's just so fancifully depressing. Mm. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. sheep farm in Australia, I can't think of anything more desolate. Yeah, sure. You know? Yeah. Having been in Australia on a cattle ranch with my sister, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and so the, the game, if it gives you a thousand points for that, is that a real reward <laughs> to the player? Um, the, the, you know, the, the count of it. The streets Cinderella. of New York are much more exciting, so you get more points for that, right? Yeah, you would yeah. think so. Yeah. I think you should get points just for getting out of the hotel room with the sheet around and nobody causing any problem about that. Yeah, and, and avoiding looking at the pornography on the, on the computer. That's right, line. yeah. Yeah, in a previous playthrough, um, I had turned on the TV that's in the room, and you can watch, like, softcore pornography, apparently, in the game. If you go out into the hallway without um, dressing yourself first, then um, I fell into this precipitous, like, like uh, punishment for doing so. Mm -hmm. So I went out on accident and had locked myself out of the room, and so I started walking through the hallway, and the next thing I knew, I'd been arrested, and I woke up with this this amnesia incident. And then the end result of that path for me was firing squad or suicide. Yep. It's like wow, for just doing that. misstep as a naked man in the hallway, and you end up getting shot or taking a suicide. But playing it as a solution. female is really odd because you're supposed to be this male persona. However, for any woman in real life who goes out in a in a strange place, not dressed. Is frightening, but then you, mm -hmm. you go up to the to the to the massage and sauna area, and there's no one around, and you're asked to choose between the two rooms, and you're going into a room, you don't know the situation, so you're frightened. There's this sense of being frightened in a strange place where you can get hurt, mm -hmm. you know, killed, mm -hmm. raped, all those things, and yet you're supposed to be a male playing that. So there's this kind of weird double experience you're having as a female player. And I just wondered if Dish had thought about that mm. um, as a gay man playing that, what would have been his feelings, and could that have been what a woman would be feeling too? Do, do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, that's really interesting. So. I'm also wondering what you might make of the, the symbolism of the, uh, the, the massage door being locked and the sauna door being open. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you have any thoughts about that? Well, you know, it's funny because I, um, there's no one in either. That when you, you, don't, you don't get a sense of anyone in either, and it didn't the, the lock and not lock didn't make any sense to me because mm -hmm. I was more concerned about am I in there alone? Mm -hmm. And then there was somebody in the massage room, and he's going to put his hands on me, and I don't know who it is. That's it's it's, it's weird, you yeah. know. Yeah. The sauna would have been a better choice, but I opted for the massage room just because, you know, 
it seems more interesting at the time. I also think that there's a potential kind of stereotype, if not um, negative negative uh, stigma to attach to you know the sauna room yeah. and what what that would mean within um, w within queer culture too. Yeah, right? yeah absolutely. Yeah. I wonder if we have any questions from anybody. Do you guys in the room have any questions for Trevor? Or even Sarah, cause, because Sarah's online and we can... Mm -hmm. Well, Sarah just commented that the only way to win is to be morally courageous, and it's difficult to do. Uh, and she asks a question, uh, have you had a chance to look at the programming notes to see where Dish made connections, ideas about his narrative intentionality there? Yes, I, I actually did. That's how I came up with some of the notes I have for today's posting on Twitter and, and, and some of the chat. But yeah, I, I, I did look over them. Um, they're pretty detailed notes, but still it, the idea that you have to be brave in order to win, that's traditionally how, what Agons are all about anyway. Mm -hmm. You can't be a hero without an Agon, mm -hmm. and the more Agons you have, the more heroic. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, playing this game and continuing failing, getting into the streets of New York, I felt like a loser. Mm. And I think that that's, that's pretty much how you feel in a lot of adventure games when you play them, when you can't seem to to figure out the, the, the puzzle, the, the riddle, the game part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, especially the set up of this game, which is you don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. you, you can verify where you, where you are immediately, but you don't have a sense of where you fit in that. And so when you fall into these amnesia spells, these moments where you know, you're going down a staircase and then all of a sudden you wake up in a hospital mm -hmm. and it's not really a hospital you're dreaming, you're actually in a prison. And, and these, these uh, kind of nested experiences that are connected to your ability to verify where you are um, doesn't allow you a whole lot of time to explore exactly who you are and what you're supposed to be doing because you're so much kind of feeling out the, the spaces, mm -hmm. if that makes any yeah. sense. So for me, it takes a really long time in these text-based adventures specifically to get a, a, a sense of space. Yeah. And um, what I think is really um, fascinating about the way that this, this game interrupts that, where you are, are for me, I'm, I like, again, like to take my time um, inventorying the room and, and figuring out where mm -hmm. the space is, and then there are these intrusions to not let you do that yeah. of, I tr I'm even trying to leave the rooms. Like, hang on a second, you have to answer the phone mm -hmm. first. So how much agency do you really have in pursuing the question to who am I? Because that's in all caps at the very beginning of it. So the... Um, well, that was part of the criticism by Computer Gaming World about this game, mm -hmm. is that it wasn't a... And Nick Mossberg's book, uh, Twisted Little Passages, both of which mm -hmm. um, comment about the fact that it's not an open world, right? Mm -hmm. It's very closed in because of the notion that it's supposed to have a story arc. There is supposed to be a, a novel in this. Mm -hmm. And so this hybrid, and it's promoted as a hybrid novel game, right? And so it tries to step in both, both worlds, and um, it's criticized for, for embracing the novel. Mm -hmm. And I think what makes it so fabulous is the novel. Mm -hmm. You know, because this, as you were pointing out, so much of the language is so rich, and the descriptions are so rich. This is what text space is all about anyway. It's about writing, it's mm -hmm. about descriptions, mm -hmm. and about the play that it entices you to engage in. Mm -hmm. And I think it has that quality, but if you're a young person in 1986 who's inculcated with games that are strictly game-oriented and open, and not so much the artis artistry of the writing, then you probably would see this as a very limited environment. Or if, you're, mm -hmm. if your notion of interactive fiction is broad, then this this definitely doesn't fit that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but looking at it, we were talking about looking at this from a novel standpoint, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. And I, I did not come, of all the work I've done on this and trying to find uh, commentary, I haven't seen anyone writing about it as a novel. Mm. And I think that's where it needs to be, you know, analyzed. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly that's the world that Dish is coming from, right? Yeah. That uh, emphasis on, on the moral what was the, the, the exact phrase again, Nick, if you don't mind? The, the only way to win is to be morally courageous. Morally and courageous. it's difficult to do. Yeah. That's from Sarah. Yeah. Um, that, that moral courage, I think, is something that really is, like you were saying just a minute ago, um, part of, of the, the hero aspect mm -hmm. of, of, of playing a game. And uh, many long-form narrative games 
are always pushing that territory. You can go and explore it. I'm thinking now specifically of uh, like Bethesda games, mm -hmm. where you can go, you know, these forking paths and have these more complicated um, moral, um, I guess, performances mm -hmm. of identity. But in this, I think it's very, very binary. And the resistance to calling it open world, I, I totally understand that and would and would agree with, because there is a there's a line you're supposed to follow, and the game um, it asserts that to you, gives you opportunities to find it, and if you don't, then it, obviously your session is mm -hmm. over, uh, as opposed to a more open world sandbox kind of game where you have a spectrum of behavior that's acceptable. This doesn't have that affordance in it and you may be able to write that off to well that's the, the technology that's doing that because they only have so much that they could put on the disc but I think more to the point that you're saying it's it's and I agree with this too is that it's it's more of a rhetoric in play than yeah. a limitation of the technology that uh, if dish wanted us to explore these issues um, kind of more openly then they wouldn't the experience wouldn't be as on rails as it is, right? right? And I think the thing that, that Sarah points out about moral, moral courage is that in, in two of the plays I went through on Saturday when I was up here in the lab, um, in one case I went to Purgatory mm. and I, ha I was asked what my name was and if I could come up with the right name I would be released. Mm. The second time I was in Hell and the River Styx was there and Charon and all the stuff in the Greek mythology. So mm -hmm. you have that kind of Greek ethos there already. Mm -hmm. And I'm asked the same question and I, you know, you get several tries and I put together everything from John Cameron III to um, Xavier Hollings to a mixed math of all of them and I couldn't get out and end up in hell. Mm. So there is this, you know, notion of the afterlife and punishment um, or reward Mm -hmm. Or doing the right thing, or saying the right thing, saying the right thing, saying yeah. the right thing, right. you know. So, um, which I think is interesting. So, let me ask you a question because okay. this is why. I mean, one of the reasons why I love doing these live traversals on, in this room is because we're using the original equipment, mm -hmm. right? I mean, anyone can play this game on an emulator right now, mm -hmm. right? It's available, mm -hmm. but this game was published on this. Here it is, the original. You know, um, five and a quarter floppy. Mm -hmm. um, and it was meant for that computer, the Apple IIe, uh, and it has, the IIe is 1986-ish, mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. It's very nice. It lasted mm -hmm. 13 years on the market. It's one of the oldest, the most successful Macintosh yeah. ever produced That's by right. Apple. Um, and Steve Jobs didn't want to continue the project. If you ever saw the biography mm -hmm. on Jobs, they make a big deal of it. Mm -hmm. But it's a fantastic machine, mm -hmm. and this one's still running like a champ. Yeah, it is. Um, but, you know, that said, there are quirky things. Mm -hmm you know, about the system, these early systems, and the way floppy disks, removable objects, work in them. So would you want to speak to that for a minute? Yeah, if I could personalize it even. Um, one of my sons was uh, asking me about what I was doing here today, and I was trying to explain it, and, and actually this emulation thing came up because um, mm -hmm. I, I had it running in an emulator. Mm -hmm. And for him, he was asking, so well, what was it like to do it back in the day? And I said, well, the computer was only a single-use object. It wasn't that you could have it in a window here. So, look, I've got an emulator running it right now, and I also have my Twitter, and I also have my web page, and I have my email checking all at the same time, that it, it forces a focus into the experience. Mm -hmm. That, it, you know, the limits of technology, obviously, are underneath all of that, and, you know, to Steve Jobs' credit, if you want to say, you know, he wanted the, the computer to be more multi-purpose than that, to do m many things all at the same time. But I think that there is something really elegant and powerful about being able to focus on just the one thing, the single purpose. And I, I, I really honestly get a kinetic charge out of <laughs> taking the, the disc in and out of it because the it, there's almost um, a, uh, this is going to sound really, really smalty and dumb, but there's almost a kind of a symbiotic relationship that's happening between mm -hmm. you and the machine where it not only is waiting for you, um, but it needs you in a different way than modern computers do. And so I was explaining this to my son. It's like your, even your cell phone can run all these different processes all at the same time, but this is uniquely running this software in this instance for your playthrough, and it's not concerned about anything else. And how many um, computing tasks can you talk about today in the 21st mm -hmm. century that are that exclusive? You know, here's my window, here's my window, here's my 400 tabs in my mm -hmm. Firefox browser or whatever. 
um, the uh, ability just to to be really close in with it. We read a like a novel. Yeah, right? y yeah. I mean that. I mean, you pick that. I think this is a kind of a um, breadcrumb, right, mm. from the from the print world to mm. the digital world. I mean, that's why I think these these objects, not just the disc, but just these objects, these folios, are so valuable because they do point to a time in which we were coming from print, moving to the digital world that's you know involved in the floppies. And we're still saying, but look, still it really exists. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was not that many years ago when somebody would argue that digital was not was not real. There wasn't anything there. It was not material. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody would say, oh yeah, but but this existed. Well, this isn't the 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 work. The work is on that disc, and that disc is material. And stuff that's mm -hmm. on that disc is material. The words are material because they take up space. I mean. There is there's a material aspect to it, but this gave it the feeling of physicality that mm -hmm. people just couldn't grasp at the time we were making this leap into this new medium. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so I think that's an interesting thing to think about. And I, so the the breadcrumb idea, and I think also the fact that people long for physical. So when you mention the the touching of the thing, there's a lot of work written about mana mm -hmm. in the ANAs, the the touch. The being able to touch something and the, the, the touch back mm -hmm. of something, mm -hmm. so the experience. Uh, and I, you know, when you even think of something like um, the Sistine Chapel, where God is touching Adam's finger, that you know, spark of divinity mm -hmm. um, is viewed there. But it's really about mana. I'm touching you, and, and there's a magic that occurs. Mm -hmm. And so we're getting magic from these objects as we touch them, mm -hmm. which then speaks to the notion about what happens when we move into the cloud technology and we migrate all things there, and there's no more touch. Mm -hmm. How is that affecting the way we, you know, experience objects? We think about our place in the universe. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, we're talking thousands of years of mana mm -hmm. <laughs> and magic, mm -hmm. you know, kind of gone, yeah, and these yeah. things don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, you buy a game on Steam, you're not getting this. Right, yeah. So the mod is happening on the keyboard or, the, or on the, the um, mm -hmm. device itself. It's something that, as you were saying, it was really, really lovely what you just said. Um, I'm also thinking now about if, if, if Dish has something that he wants to pursue, how do I say this without becoming too convoluted, of um, the, the mana, the, the touch mm -hmm. that is that is forbidden, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, all right. the uh, for him, what right? Yeah, exactly. That there's there's the um, there's there's a physical interaction. There's the magic of transference. But uh, I guess another way to say this was be would be um, to look. You can see, but you can't touch. Yeah. So you also can't largely speak to this either. So how do you see yourself? The game asks you from the very beginning and tells you discreetly you're wrong. Like you. Tell me what you see. How do you project yourself? And the game's like, no, that's nope, not, not you. <laughs> so you can see yourself, and it's wrong. And if you reach out in the world, there are real harsh punishments for things that you do and don't feel or experience, mm -hmm. right? So in that last chunk that I was just going through, there are references for things for, for me to chase out. But the, the narrative layer of the game, by using the mechanic of, of amnesia itself, mm -hmm. um, here are plot points and here are even set pieces inside the game that we're going to breadcrumb you, to use that word in a different way now, um, to get you to those places, but uh, the amnesia is kind of like uh, preventing you from doing that. So you get a trace of it, but you can't actually verify it immediately. And if you do go to verify it, um, it's really hesitant to give you any kind of positive mm -hmm. um, response to that. Makes me wonder about how uh, deliberate he is in exploring this issue of the forbidden, yeah. and uh, once and you get and there's so much forbidden. Right? Yes, there's so much. Yeah, and there's also so much meditation on the body in here too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like trying to grasp through straws and like the little details of it. Is the first real Dang. articulation of the character is you are a body and this particular body at that. And, and every time so you try specific. to choose a different a different hair or a different <coughs> facial feature. No, you can't be blue eyes. And no, you're wrong. <laughs> you're wrong. And not just that, but you're wrong. You know, yeah. Any co any other comments or something? Questions for out here? I think he did a really good job at capturing um, like his wit 
mm-hmm. within the game. Like, I know at one read-through I was looking at screenshots and it talked about, you know, him finding little breadcrumbs about uh, writing that he had. And he said, oh God, I hope I'm not a poet. Mm-hmm. But he's <laughs> a poet. And so he kind yeah, of makes yeah. his own jabs at himself mm-hmm. in a way that makes the playthrough pretty enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really insightful. I think there's there's a lot of uh, se- uh, self-reference, mm-hmm. not to, like, the person and, perf- uh, yeah, the persona that he's trying to put out there as author of this, but in terms of what are you doing right now in the kind of metaphys- uh, the metafictional move to incorporate the brand of the computer that you're typing on. So it's an Apple computer in the hotel room with you if you load it on an Apple computer. It's uh, if you load it on a Commodore computer, then it's a Commodore computer <laughs> in the hotel room with you. And uh, I, I think it, at even the sentence and paragraph level of it, it it's very conscious of itself. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a very writerly kind of experience. And you can see why a market, I mean, the way this was marketed, if you go and look at the ads and some of the things that online even now, it's, it's marketed to a young crowd of young gamers. And that this would have been lost on them. Mm-hmm. This would not have been um, something they would gravitate to yeah, necessarily. So right. it's really written for us, mm-hmm. right? At a time when people like us were this is not necessarily, you know, using computers to read art. Mm-hmm. This is art. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, I mean, we, we we represent the Electronic Literature Organization. We existed, you know, in parts around the country. But there weren't a lot of us, and then we weren't an organization, mm-hmm. so the market would have been extremely small. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you can see why there was, you know, the computer gaming world probably pan- well, it did panic, right? Yeah, but if I might borrow Actually, this again from you, um, here I, I know that I started this with this uh, uh, disclaimer or kind of overview from from Electronic Arts, not an organization, a company, but to fulfill the potential of personal computing and enough imagination and enthusiasm, we think there's a good chance for success. So what does success look like to them? And what would success look like to DISH? What does success look like to us as the player? And I think that part of what might have been going on with this in this moment was um, it's definitely not geared for younger players because of such adult content that's in there. There's incredible, (laughs) you know, there's some graphic interludes in here that aren't just sexual but also there's quite violent yeah. right um so there's a there's a more adult audience if you think in 1986 who would have access to this sort of thing in their home yeah the same way you have a library and you're picking up a novel from that shelf to read that um how aware is both the producer distributor of that object and then also its author creator uh aware of you as the audience and i think that to the points you were raising earlier that, that they had a pretty clear eye on who they wanted to be doing this mm-hmm. uh, and, and playing this. And it would have been um, somebody, obviously an adult, with some disposable income, with time. Mm-hmm. Because this is not a short game. No. And you know we just barely, barely scratched the surface. I mean, hell, I didn't even get out of the <laughs> hotel room. I didn't get a chance to look at the satchel yet. And it seems like the, one of the biggest rewards in the game from us talking about it over the past few weeks is getting to explore the digital city itself Mm -hmm. that regardless of the score and the inventory if you can get out of the hotel room and start making use of these objects the maps that are that have been drawn for it the uh you know the text pamphlets that are that are part of the the veneer of it it's uh you have to have resources and you have to have time mm-hmm. and um your and those computers cost you know they were very dollars. expensive back in the day so it isn't just hey and every man kind of thing there's mm-hmm. something very niche about what's going on here but uh it seems like it's it's uh, been made for um educated mm-hmm. and um yeah people with resources yeah mm-hmm. and the uh, computer gaming um magazine that this that reviewed it if you look at all the ads, it's a very youthful youth group, right? Mm-hmm. It's not an adult gamer type, and there was not. I mean, the, it was a different market than this would have been aimed for. Yeah. For pornography alone. Yeah, you know? sure. I mean, it says don't let your kids play this. Yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, and for really obviously good and reasons. And computer gaming, you know, disses it and for if it I being a novel. You know. If I put this also in its in its kind of um, moment in gaming culture. Uh, in the mainstream in 1985, 1986, that's 
after the Atari bust. Mm -hmm. That's um, with Nintendo's uh, original 8-bit system landing with incredible force in both Japan and the United States. And those younger players, they were being marketed to heavily and they were accounted mm -hmm. for in lots of ways. And here is kind of like, well, here's a more serious yeah. element because, you know, games are for children. Mm -hmm. And they have their fancy, you know, but still like cartoony controllers and day glow kind of architecture that go along with that. But here's something, you know, serious yeah. for yeah. the more discerning. Um, you know, someone who wants more than just an immediate kind of gratification. Because you can save the game too. Yeah, and one of the things that you and I were talking about is 86 was such a ripe year for authoring systems. Mm -hmm. You know, because this was built on the King Edwards gaming language uh, and uh, authoring language. Then we had also at the same time HyperCard was, you know, was, you know, um, yeah. was released in 90, was given to Apple in 1987 to license on computers. Uh, at the same time, Hypergate was, I think Mark Bernstein was playing with Hypergate already. Judy Malloy was already working with Narrowbase and the beginnings of Story Space. So we see all, mm -hmm. and then Intermedia. So all these, these language and these mm -hmm. um, authoring systems emerging because there's this incredible drive to create for that object, mm -hmm. these objects, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we had to have some way to do that um, and, and, and without having to become programmers ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once you have this incredible machine, not in your business place, because we were talking earlier mm -hmm. before we started recording about what would this be like in a, as a DOS experience mm -hmm. as opposed to something on the Apple IIe. This, uh, I mean, you could find these machines, of course, in educational environments and also in some enterprise environments, but largely this was designed as a home machine. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, what did we want the home to, I guess, be tran? How do we want the home, the home to be transformed by this particular mm -hmm. machine? And uh, we know people would come to it with reading experiences, with watching experiences, but how much interactivity were they looking for in their entertainment? And creativity. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? That's probably time then to wrap up. Thank you, Trevor, this for doing this blast. today, so and much, I can't wait to see what you write out of this. This is going to be fun. I'm very, very excited to write something critical yeah. about this because I think it's uh, well, it, it's pivotal in, in some really important ways, um, both as, as a commercial enterprise, as something really striving for mainstream, but then also you know the, the persona of the author himself mm -hmm. and, and what he's trying to exercise of sorts. Yeah, and just, just to remind everybody, we released chapter one of our Rebooting Electronic Literature. And so if you're following us on Facebook and Twitter and even on the chat, you'll find the link to chapter one, which is Sarah Smith Kicking in Space. We're delighted to have that uh, mm -hmm. as our first chapter. Once again, thank you, Sarah, for sharing this, this work with us and making this possible and for recommending this work for the traversal. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.